Sorry. Welcome, everyone. My name is Peter Wanders. I'm the president and CEO of Anderson Ranch. On behalf of our trustees and our staff, I'm thrilled to welcome you here today. This is going to be a really great program, and it's great to see such an overflowing audience. Uh, I want to start by recognizing that Anderson Ranch's campus resides within the historic tribal area of the Ute people. Um, in honor of that legacy, we really want to commit all of us, and we ask you to commit to making this an, ex an inclusive place, a place that honors difference, honors change, and brings everyone together as a community. It's a really special place, and we are excited to have you all here. Anderson Ranch is an education and art-making place. Our mission is not to create things, but to create change in the lives of the people who come through our programs. We're excited uh, by that, and we're excited by the exploration of artists exploring their thoughts, exploring their processes, and really exploring their community and their interactions with the other people that are here. I want to thank those of you on our National Council. Give me a little wave. Uh, you guys really make the ranch possible, uh, supporting us year-round, supporting us through COVID, uh, and really helping us keep this machine running. And it means a great deal uh, to us. About 175 families make that possible, and we'd like to make it 176 today. So on your way out, if you're not a member, talk to somebody on the staff. We really do need your support to continue to be able to do the work that we do here. Uh, this lecture series is part of that mission. Uh, it brings some of the top artists in the world to our community to share their motivations, their artistic practices, and connect with artists and connect with you as part of our community. I uh, want to thank Mel and Adam Lewis. Uh, they continue to be the title underwriters of this series uh, in honor of Toby Devin Lewis, uh, former trustee of Anderson Ranch, uh, the curator of the Progressive Collection, and just an amazing human being that I know many of you were friends with. Uh, we also have individual supporters who help make this series possible. Uh, Rona and Jeff Citrin, Eleanor and Domenico Di Soleil, Sherry and Joe Felson, Liza and John Mauck, Amnon and Katie Rodan, and Reggie and Lee Smith, uh, our board chair and our chair of our national council. So thank you for all the work that you do. With no further ado, I'm going to pass over to Douglas. He's the curator in residence uh, this summer for the ranch, and he'll introduce our program. Thank you, Douglas. Thanks. Thanks, Peter. Hi, everybody. Uh, welcome back to Anderson Ranch for the third in our five summer series conversations uh, of 2023. Um, I live in Los Angeles, and in 2016, I saw an incredible exhibition at the Museum of Contemporary Art, which made a really deep impact on me. The exhibition was entitled, Do I Look Like a Lady? And was an immersive installation and exhibition by today's summer series speaker, Micheline Thomas, that featured a group of silkscreen portraits alongside an installation inspired by 1970s domestic interiors, as well as an amazing two-channel video that wove together a chorus of black female performers, past and present, including stand-up comedians Jackie, Moms, Mabley, Wanda Sykes, and pop culture icons Eartha Kitt and Whitney Houston. It was mesmerizing, it was radical, it really is still with me today after all these years, and I can't be more excited to have Micheline the author of that exhibition here with us today. Um, alongside a busy career exhibiting around the world at numerous major museums whose collections also feature her work, Thomas is also a Tony Awards nominated co-producer, a curator, an educator, a museum board member, and also a mentor to many emerging artists. So both of our guests today are very multi-talented. Significantly, Thomas is also a returning visitor to Anderson Ranch for maybe the fourth time, I believe, having previously been here in 2010 as a visiting artist in the printmaking studio, then returning to teach again in teaching painting in 2017, and coming back to work in the ceramic studio as well. And we're thrilled to welcome her for the fourth time today. We're also excited to welcome our multi-talented co-speaker, Jasmine Wahi, to Anderson Ranch for the first time, hopefully not the last. An entrepreneur as well as a curator and scholar, Wahi is the co-founder and co-director of Project for Empty Space, an ambitious and innovative woman-run arts nonprofit based in Newark, New Jersey, and New York City that is a multifaceted and on their mission statement, fem-powered people of the global majority BIPOC queer institution committed to creating unapologetically radical ecosystems for creatives. A phrase that I particularly hold dear to my heart and love the way it is spoken. While he's been a speaker in the TED Talk series, has been a faculty member at Yale University, the School of Visual Arts MFA program in New York, and is currently, if I have this right, um, a mem uh, teach a faculty member at Brooklyn College in New York. 
In 2020, she became the inaugural Holly Block Social Justice Curator at the Bronx Museum of the Arts, and this year was honored by the Metropolitan Museum of Art for exemplary social impact work in the arts in both uh, for her work at Project Empty Space, as well as her other roles as both a museum curator and an independent practitioner. Please join me in welcoming Jasmine Wahi and Micheline Thomas to the stage. Thanks. All right, well, thank you all so much for being here today. Thank you to Anderson Ranch for having us. Yeah. And thanks for Mickey for yeah. being in conversation with me. I know. So we have, oh, you know what? Before I we even need start, to set I'm, the time, I'm gonna we can do talk. a timer because we can talk for a long time. Um, so we have a lot to go through yeah. today, um, a lot of different topics. And um, as someone said yesterday, are you going to be controversial? And I said, you just have to wait and find out. Never so know. we'll wait and find Never out. Never know what she may throw. Um, but we'll start. <laughs> oh, sorry. Speak up. Speak up. Maybe you Is should. Is there a way to turn uh, up the mic a little bit? I'll just, you know, we're friends. <laughs> Here you go. Talk. Is that better? Wait. Her, hers needs no, to be it's up not a better? little. Yeah, yeah, there we go. Okay, I will, I will project as well. Um, there you go. There oh, we that's go. me. Um, <laughs> <laughs> it's always about me. No, just kidding. <laughs> um, I'm going to start with a softball question, and it will Ooh. come back around in our in our larger discussion. Um, I make that kind of work too. <laughs> <laughs> I like glitches. Um, how do you get it done in the studio? Yeah, that's a good question. I how do I get? I, I'm turn this up. How do I get it done in the studio? Um, in many ways, I'm, you know, for a long period of time, I worked in my studio by myself. Mm -hmm. um, but as my career developed and sort of grown and the demand of production grown, I have an incredible team that I uh, have in my studio that have been working with me some for almost 13 years. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, I think in the way in which uh, I work with the people in my studio is really not necessarily, I wouldn't say collaborators, but they are very instrumental and great assets to the production and process. Um, a lot of times I have my production manager, Jeff Freeland, who is also an artist. He used to work, I kind of stole him away from Takashi Murakami. Um, because Cas casually, <laughs> casually uh, <laughs> because of his uh, expertise in silkscreen, mm -hmm. and um, I uh, was transitioning and transforming my practice, and he is was a master at it, and so I really wanted someone in my space that could sort of guide me and, and lead me the way in that. But um, a lot of ways in which we and I work is I'll have an idea mm -hmm. um, or I'll have or I'll read something or something will sort of inspire me or trigger a thought or emotion um, or it could, it could be an event and then I'll come back to the studio and say what do you think we could do um, um, this type of work and I for example when I was wanting to do um, make some videos. Mm -hmm. um, I had this idea, I was collecting these images and speaking about the work that Doug was inspired by that he saw, Do I Look Like a Lady? I have been collecting archival images and uh, video snippets of particular black women mm -hmm. and celebrity and women in the world as icons that I look to as inspiration or had created amazing platforms for others. Yes. And so I started collecting all of these images, whether they were entertainers or actors or comedians, and I had collected them for years, but I didn't know what to do with them. Um, and I knew I wanted to do a type of visual score with them or create a narrative mm -hmm. about sort of the black woman's uh, arc and sort of uh, trials and tribulations within sort of celebrity. Mm -hmm. um, and some of which had completely downfalls or they had sort of great sort of um, admiration or success in their field. But there would be something, for example, take Whitney Houston, sort of her addiction or whatever else in her life 
had contribute to some of the demise of her career. Right. And so looking at these women and how people perceive them in the world. Um, and so I was just kind of storing these images. And so through conversation with other staff in my studio, really utilizing their skills. And mm -hmm. one of them at my studio was really great at editing. <laughs> but without conversation at the studio and really thinking about who they are as individuals and not just looking at them as work hand and um, allowing them to sort of bring forth some of the things that they enjoy doing mm -hmm. to be a part of my practice. And so that's how I started really getting into some of my editing processes with video. So really utilizing sort of their sort of skills and expertise, but really making my space, um, I think the reason why so many of them have been there for so long is because it is a community and it is a space where I respect them, I respect their time, and I pay them well. Yeah, well, that is always important, especially in this industry. You know, with benefits and, you know, 401k and all that, you know, I, I give a really good package, great benefit package. Uh, are you hiring right now? Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, so this idea of community is going to come back several times mm -hmm. um, throughout your practice as an artist, yeah. as well as an arts active, activist, advocate, and mm -hmm. educator. Um, so we will come back to that, but I want to come back a little bit to thinking about the portrayal of that black women. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm sure many people in this room are familiar with some of your early work. So I want, for the sake of time, for us to start actually with a show that you did last year at mm -hmm. L'Orangerie in okay. Paris. And thinking about the way that Paris has impacted, not just Paris, but, but France yeah, has yeah. impacted your work in the way that you have incorporated some of your experiences there, as well as the Western art history mm -hmm. that's happening there into what you did in that show. Yeah. The yeah. pieces that you created, um, particularly the really uh, magnificent large piece um, on the Yeah, and some of those will floor. pop up. Yeah, so I'm sorry, sort of as we're talking through. about it, they're not showing up, but they'll... Um, Tell me a little bit about this process. And the reason I'm starting with this, just to give some context, is you were, and I think to date are, the first black woman artist to show in that museum, which is a really incredible Yeah, because uh, Lorna deal. Simpson was at Jus de Palme. Yes. yes. Yeah. Um, yeah. And I think that is um, remarkable historically. And I think um, the way that you intervened into that very particular type of space is important, um, especially moving forward as we look towards what's coming up for you. So can you talk a little bit yeah, about that I think, show? Yeah, that, I mean, that show, I think, came for me as an artist full circle in mm -hmm. some ways. I had, um, just to give a little backstory, had um, the privilege and um, benefit to do a residency in 2011 at Giverny in uh, the north of France. And Giverny, and it's uh, uh, Monet's estate. Mm -hmm. And it's an incredible estate that he's built out, mainly for his own practice, mm -hmm. but also as a community for his American artist friends. Yeah. And so there's a great relationship with Giverny and Versailles and the um, American friends of Versailles that created this residency for American artists to spend anywhere from a month to six months, whatever time they can carve out of their practice, to, to live on this estate and among sort of Monet's sort of garden. Yes. Um, and so that was probably one of my first times uh, being away um, the US for that long period of time in a place where I didn't even speak the language. Um, but also in a place where I had a lot of fascination with uh, the uh -huh. French culture, French Impressionism, was a huge part of my trajectory and practice as an undergrad. I was very interested in Seurat and um, um, pointillism. So for me, this was like a really great opportunity to really start to understand why am I interested in these artists. Um, but during my time at Giverny, um, I didn't make any paintings. I made about 200 collages, took a lot of photographs, experimented with on my phone some video and then got a camera and did some video shoots and different things, just uh, really trying to figure it out, but also... Wait, tell us a little bit about some of those videos. 
the videos, oh yeah. So the, one of the videos, um, this estate is really majestic. It's, it's beautiful. Um, it's also a tourist spot. So during the day, they get hundreds of people walking through just to go through the gardens. But as a residency, you have the fortunate to have the key so you can go anytime, even before like the- And very casual. Very casually. And so um, there are other artists who would visit, like David Hockney. So I had the time, you know, sometimes I would see him walking through and sometimes I wouldn't. So I found it very interesting to create this video where I was like looking and searching for Hockney and Monet as this journey. So I got this painter's jacket and I videotaped, I had the other fellow artists videotape me walking through the gardens as I was looking for these artists, these mm -hmm. male sort of figures to sort of inspire or maybe if I sat next on, next, next to David Hockney on a green bench, I can ask him questions about his practice or Monet and mm -hmm. why he's there. Um, but it was like this, it was like the first sort of uh, video that I was contemplating sort of like the longing or the desire to discover, you know, yeah. or to interact with some artists that you only seen in reproduction. Right. Um, and so after making these series of collages, I, I really put them away. I didn't really think about the work that I made there. I didn't, I considered some of the process of the making of those images as resources for paintings, resources for future works. And a lot of what you see here are from those collages. Um, but I think what I really started thinking about while I was there was sort of myself as a black woman mm -hmm. and sort of my place in this um, Western canon and where did I fit in right. or do I fit in? And so I was really kind of in, in, at a point contemplating whether I had the um, validation or should I be making this type right. of work, you know? And so I was really apprehensive to really start being the type of artist that could just make a landscape. <laughs> Right. You know, the privilege to be an artist to say that I'm not necessarily making work about identity. Mm -hmm. So it was this really sort of place of, for me, thinking, do I have that sort of privilege like a white male to say, I'm going to make a still life and I'm just going to make a still life for the sake of For the sake of doing it, right. For the sake of observation, mm -hmm. <laughs> the sake of sort of what a flower or still life may, m might mean to me at that point, you right. know. Um, and so unencumbered, unencumbered, mm -hmm. un in sort of like about social political ideas. And so when I came back, I attempted that and then got pushback <laughs> for that work that people wanted to see the black body. Right. Right. And we're talking right now about 2012. -ish, 2012. 11, 12, yeah. Yeah. So those works were just like, you know, the galleries weren't interested. The collectors weren't interested. Um, and I just was really concerned about, okay, maybe I should think about this. What is happening in the work with the black body that people are responding to? Mm -hmm. But what is happening with those works in reference to the West, Western canon? Right. And then through conversation with someone like Denise Morel, um, who you know was the curator of the black model that started at Columbia University and then traveled to other parts of Europe, I think Musée d'Orsay. Um, my conversation with her about the black model and this discovery about how these particular artists, these particular white male artists, painted and mm -hmm. sort of historically had the or relationships with Algerian or black women or mm -hmm. African women and Matisse's relationship with the black model from Harlem, right. you know? But all of these images, how they were sort of, uh, not necessarily that they were removed from history, they just weren't talked about. Right. So I felt like there was this way of erasure from an artist practice that I was just really concerned about um, within these male sort of artists, within Manet, within Matisse, with all of Courbet. Like these artists, there was a part within their historical practice that was being uh, deliberately mm -hmm 
removed out of history. Right. Contextualized through a very monolithic, monolithic lens. And just simplify to what uh, historians thought were uh, relevant at the mm -hmm. time for knowledge and sort of exposure for people to, to tell, to, to create a narrative of story based on those artists. So I was interested in the idea of reinserting myself and claiming myself as that black woman of erasure in these spaces and aligning that and seeing if that, how, how does that conversation shift? Um, and that really started to begin the journey with Stop, I stopped really looking at myself and started bringing in other models, mm -hmm. um, whether they were friends, families, or lovers, and really thinking about how they can sort of change this discourse of conversation through the gaze. Yeah. I mean, I would say that your work, as we're sitting here talking about it, I'm thinking that the practice or the discipline of art history historically particularly when you're talking about figurative painting and Eurocentric mm -hmm. figurative painting, has been incredibly reductive in creating mm -hmm. a monolithic history. And what your work does, um, particularly in, in the works that we're talking about right now, serves as an antidote to that. It yeah, creates it a, an additive process to a history that becomes multi-centric instead becomes of monolithic. It becomes multi-centric, but it also becomes questionable for even myself to go, do I have the right to make these. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> the, the sort of suggestion of imposter syndrome yeah, imposter into syndrome. Exactly. these spaces that have historically not been for people like us unless we were the subject mm -hmm. or the ancillary yeah, character. Yeah, the ancillary, and then started looking at that, us as the ancillary in the servitude positions and wanting to really sort of uh, uh, disrupt that notion of that we're more than that and that. And then it just led me to really think about, not necessarily from the white male's point of view in the Western canon, but start looking at sort of uh, black printed matter and how it also has shifted um, our notion and sort of uh, respectability politics mm -hmm. and how we see ourselves. And, and, where, and that led me to the Jet magazines. Yes, I was just gonna mm -hmm. ask, where, where did that transition happen for you? It's I interesting. It's interesting. It kind of, it wasn't a linear sort of, sort of transition. It was actually a zigzag because when I was in Giverny, that was in 2012, right? 11, mm -hmm. 12. But when I was thinking about sort of the notion of printed matter, black printed matter and Jet Magazine was actually when I was in, when I was in graduate school. So I started exploring sort of the notion of the black body and myself through photographic images, first photographing my mother, mm -hmm. then myself, and then really looking at uh, the particular beauty of the week and the Jet Magazine as a point of reference for my um, thesis dissertation, and use that as a way of navigating through space and looking at particular figures like Mary J. Blige and Little Kim at that time and how they personified themselves through media mm -hmm. and what that meant through that personification of black women at that time and mm -hmm. how, you know, you thought of Little Kim at that point of reference, at that point of time, really taking on sort of white ideology by mm -hmm. wearing the black wig, the blonde wig yeah. and sort of what that meant in sort of media and how we saw ourselves, that shift. So I was kind of conflicted with that, but also using <laughs> those things for me to really, and these, if you can hold it here for a second, because these are, uh, this is a show I did at Wexner um, Art Museum. And some of these images, the one with me with the green background and the striped, uh, the tiger swimsuit was from that series of um, The Beauty of the Week. And it was also from my thesis show. So some of those were like some of those early photographs where I was investigating um, self through uh, printed matter and images and sort of recontextualizing, but also thinking of the same time Adrian Piper mm -hmm. and um, Cindy Sherman, looking at a lot of their early works in a performative way. Mm -hmm. I took a Kelly Jones performance art class at the same time taking a class with 
the photographer, you may, many of you know, David Hilliard, who was my photo teacher at Yale. Um, and he was so instrumental in my photographic practice mm -hmm. because he really, as uh, my photo instructor, and encouraged me at the time to photograph someone I had the most difficult time with. <laughs> and at that point of time in my life, it was my mother. Right. And so I went back and photographed him. And it was because a lot of his work was about his relationship with his father. Yeah. And so, um, and his identity with queerness and stuff. And so it was the similarity um, that I was working through at that time that he saw. Mm -hmm. And so he said, basically, here, use this camera as a way of discovering not only yourself, but making work. And yeah. that was really how... In the, the, in the most like challenging and yeah, vulnerable mm -hmm. of ways. How the photographic process and image making and photographing myself and my photographing my mother became a really uh, important sort of element in every way for mm -hmm. my, my work. My mother being my first muse, which was at first challenging um, on many levels, but then seeing her as someone intergenerationally um, embracing her own prowess and sensuality and sexuality and exposing of herself in a most intimate and vulnerable way allowed me, she became a mirror mm -hmm. um, for myself yeah. and sort of creating narrative and begin, and that led to wanting to tell other stories through <coughs> domesticity and creating these spaces. Sort of a, a liberatory practice mm -hmm. through self-discovery. Mm -hmm. Um, it's, it's quite healing. It's for me, a lot of my way in working and thinking is really, um, I don't often talk about it, but it is therapeutical. Mm -hmm. You know, it's very art therapy for me. It's a way in which how I really got into art, which many people don't know. I was living in Portland, Oregon, discovered Carrie Mae Weems' work, and at the same time I was doing therapy, and my therapy was through art therapy. So mm -hmm. it's this way in which I always go back to that place of healing and thinking about sort of concept concepts really do come from the personal. Right. Um, and for me, if it's not related to that, it's really hard for me to tangibly understand how to move it through. Right. Because it's, it's too a, much distance. Right. It's almost disingenuous. Mm -hmm. um, for the sake of time, I want to talk a little bit more in taking it out of sort of self-reflection from mm -hmm. the early work into where you're moving today. So we've talked about France a little bit and you have um, works in two shows about Picasso, which this mm -hmm. is for better or worse, a year of Picasso, um, and are working towards a solo exhibition. Mm -hmm. um, and a lot of the work that I've seen um, of the newer work has elements that are really, I would say, new for you or new for the public to see mm -hmm. incorporating different types of line work, incorporating neon. Mm -hmm. um, can you talk a little bit about this the somewhat shift, of a shift yeah. in, the, in the process and the new work? I guess um, it all really came about through COVID, really, through, you know, through working um, outside of the city, mm -hmm. um, working siloed without assistance, mm -hmm. working in a space in my country home, home upstate, and um, just really um, not really having full access. I think limitations are sort of the best sort of recipe for um, intervention and experimentation. Mm -hmm. um, because what COVID did for me, because I didn't have access to, oh, photographing people, Right. and doing all these other things that I had to just look around me, <laughs> you know, look at my materials that I had, look at the space. It's a, it was the space I was working in and upstate was much smaller space than I was used, used to. Um, all I had was a lot of paper, a lot of magazines I brought up. When my mother died, my mother was an avid collector of Jet and Ebony magazine. So when she died, I actually kept all of those and I moved them up to my house upstate. And so I had a stack of those magazines <laughs> just sitting in the corner. I had my printer, had all these other sort of uh, paper material and sort of prints that I made, bad prints that I kept, 
that I sort of uh, recycled f through other images. And so I just started doing what I love best, which is creating and making collage, because for me it's a way of really figuring out and navigating. It's a way of drawing and thinking and sort of thinking about a process of ideas. Um, and it's a way of just like, it's a comfort zone, you know, and, and, and sort of analyzing sort of my sort of thought process. And so I just started looking at some of my earlier work found some writings from earlier scrapbooks. It was this time of looking back mm -hmm. and looking and searching and wanting to figure out, okay, what if I'm gonna have to stay here for the next year or two? Yeah. What if I'm not gonna see anyone? You know, what would one make? Right. What would one do? And so um, I just looked at my space around me, looked at a sketchbook that I found that had an image about beauty of the week. Uh -huh. And it had a jet cutout image, and it had all of these other writings and sort of, uh, a, it had a list of things that I wanted to do related to those works. And I thought, wow, I've never even done this. Yeah. Like, I thought about this in graduate school, but for some reason at that point I put it on the shelf and started making it different body of work. So I began just looking through and thinking about the Jet Magazine, and I remembered I had come in contact with an amazing historian named Carla Williams who's in uh, New Orleans, and she runs this store called Material Life, for life, and it's like she sells a lot of memorabilia of African-American sort of uh, limited editions. Mm -hmm. And so she had sent me as a gift. She said, I don't know if you know about these. I know you're really interested in Jet Magazine and Ebony Magazine, but do you know about these calendars? And I was like, no. And so they were these pinup calendars from the late 60s to the 80s of subscriptions of um, black female erotica mm -hmm. beauties of the month that were never really sort of, they were never, they, they were out in the world, but, but not, not mainstream. Mainstream, yeah. so because they were private subscriptions. And so I started looking at these and I was just astonished because it was, I knew about all of the other thing around Jet Magazine, um, its social political impact. On, right, and you wanna talk about respectability politics. Exactly. Like this is sort of the. And so this was like the opposite of right. that. Right. You know, and I was just astonished. And um, I just started, really looking at these images and started questioning who these women were because unlike in Jet Magazine of the beauty of the week, these women are describing who they are. Um, they're mentioning their names. They're describing who, it's almost like the first sort of Instagram selfie where they're talking about themselves and their, their desires and attributes. But unlike the beauty of the month, it was just their month. It was July, 1961. Right. January 1971. So anonymous. Very anonymous, very erotic, and I just thought, wow, when were these, why weren't these part of a real conversation of acknowledgement? Um, and I just remember wanting to provide a platform for these women in mm -hmm. the same way as the women had in Beauty of the Week. Mm -hmm. So I just started creating collages and then really started thinking about ownership of the image, archival material, do I have a right to use these, trying to figure out fair use of these images, and, and really thinking about them as a photographic way, photographically in a way of using it as a way of leading into a conversation of black sexuality that most people never really talk about or experience. Mm -hmm. And through Carla Williams and all of her images, she just started sending all of these. And I just started creating collages, but I started thinking about um, type of films and deconstruction about women who are an anonymous. How do you portray them right. in the world? And how do you create these layers of engagement that allow them a sense of place? Right. And so, I don't know, I started, Picasso has always been something I wanted to really figure out 
I think um, many people try to, he was a complicated artist, um, but very prolific, mm -hmm. right? Um, really wanted to create, so these works came out of that, Tet the Femme. These works were mainly based off of my name models, but then you have the Resist, these, these works came out of working in COVID, the Resist series. Um, and so all of this stuff just started really um, allow me to work in ways that I worked when I was an undergrad. Yeah, it was a sense of freedom of not necessarily not necessarily of being home to a system, mm -hmm. and I and it, it was refreshing. And I think that's where we sort of come full circle. That's where again. the shift came because I just you know, and I think it was too because I was sh I forgot to mention I was also sharing my studio space with my kids at the time. <laughs> So, and I had to, so I had my daughter at the time, she was about seven or eight um, during her online school, but having to do these crazy projects online and having to help her with her crazy projects. And then it's sort okay. of watching her Thank in this you. sense of freedom and play yeah. just reminded me of like, that's where you should be, mm -hmm. this sense of freedom and play of your ideas and not necessarily feeling the need to make a, a very specific type of work. Mm -hmm. I, I just think it's really interesting that now almost, well, I guess All at this the point, work. 10 years later, you are circling back with Picasso thinking about what you were thinking about in Giverny, mm -hmm. um, you know, confronting Manet, Cezanne, mm -hmm. all of these people and sort of looking at this, but in a new way of, uh, I think, sexual empowerment and liberation for black women. Um, and also having, really enjoying the distance, mm -hmm. because a lot of my earlier work, there was a great intimacy with right. working with the women Familiar in my life. Subjects, and yeah. then this way, it was this really, this distance also added that freedom of to really talk about major issues about black uh, female liberation and sexuality without mm -hmm. feeling like I this imposter. Yeah. And let's talk a little bit about the Resist series because mm -hmm. this is also, I think, a really pivotal and um, new direction. These are bronzes. Direction. Oh, if you're... Yeah. <laughs> I was like, no, they're And not. just to give you context, <laughs> a lot of what you've seen in the bronzes, when my mother died, I cleaned her house and just... Uh, everything that I decided to keep, I cast it in bronze as a memory it's to continue sort of this ongoing conversation with my relationship with my mother as my muse. So these objects that you see in bronze, like you'll see one on a relief with her jacket. That was a, her, her last jacket she wore in one of my photo shoots I did of her, her pair of pants. I think you might see, a, I don't know if the Crocs on here, she wore a pair of Crocs before she died, so I casted those. So all of those became sort of a way of creating a, a portrait. Yeah, memorial. A memorial of, of someone you love. Yeah. And but, actually, I think, no, that works really, uh, really well into this um, Resist series, which is, I think, perhaps one of your most overt displays of um, resistance and mm -hmm. uh, public protest. Uh, during a very particular time. Um, and in some ways, those images, as they're culminations of many, many images from that moment, are about community in mm -hmm. a very um, uh, legible yeah. way. Can you talk a little bit about what went into creating those works and the thought process? Because that is also a shift within your practice. Yeah, I think it really... A lot of it had to do with, you know, just everything that was happening mm -hmm. um, against and the brutality on black bodies mm -hmm. publicly. And just, uh, I start to think about, because um, I started the Resist series actually in 2016. And again, I'm sort of a really avid collector of materials and um, archival images. And I'll just, I may not know it, at that particular time why I'm sourcing these or collecting, I'm responding to them either because of the cultural event 
moments or the impact it has on me mm -hmm. or just the reference that I want to sort of remember or sort of think about for later work. But I just take them and I store them and I sort of catalog them. Um, and I was doing that for many years. Um, and I think um, it was either Brianna Taylor or someone else, something had happened. It, it was, became a trigger. Yeah. Um, and I feel like my work is very radical in a sense of me just painting and sort of telling the story about myself and being a black woman and using mm -hmm. black women in images, but never, as you stated, overtly social political where it's like, this is, this is the real statement about, and here's the message. Right. Um, it was very challenging because it was also very a painful way of working Absolutely. because really, you know, and even for my, my staff, right? Like having them do this research on for one instance, say, her, say, you know, say her name. I was like, I want a list of all the black women who have been either killed or brutalized by the who police, we know of. who we know of, right. right? Who we know of. Right. And the list was long. Right. I had one of my assistants said, I can't do it. Yeah. She's like, I can't do it. You know, because the names were just like, and then I wanted them to not only just give the names, but provide the context of what right. happened. And so we And I just, imagine the context not only of what happened, happened to, to them, them, but who they were. Who they were, the story, the other, the stories, the, the, the stories that we're not hearing. Right. Um, and so it was really just, for me, an outlet. Mm -hmm. Um, I really never intended for these paintings to be as successful as they were. I really never intended for these paintings to be shown. Mm -hmm. I really were just making them for myself. Yeah. Um, I was making them for myself and my community and my friends. I was making them for a way of sort of uh, expressing the pain, the hurt, you know, and just uh, the confusion mm -hmm. of what was happening in the world. Um, and so just started going back into, you know, as far as I could without sort of getting really emotional about it. You know, Civil Rights, Tulsa Massacre, all of yeah. these images, really, I mean, like, seeing, like, you know, brutal images of, you know, sourcing images of Emmett Till and all of this stuff of the black bodies being pretty much uh, deconstructed and destroyed. Yeah, yeah, being turned from people with people. lives into bodies. Yeah, into bodies. And so, and then wanting to figure out how I could integrate that art historically. And mm -hmm. so Goya and Garnica Picasso became seen the reference of, the point of reference that made sense to me to integrate it into a conversation yeah. of a moment of time. Because like many other artists, they use sort of their voice and platform to create or tell a narrative and story. And so I wanted it to be layered and I didn't want it to be so heavy handed. I wanted it to be like in your face and confronting, but I also wanted people to be able to access it. Right. So that way that they can understand the impact yeah. of these images. And I think, um I actually didn't realize that you didn't intend for them to be uh, publicly disseminated or seen um, in a larger, more public context. But I think there's something really important mm -hmm. about that, um, not only framing them within the art context, mm -hmm. but thinking about audience. Because mm -hmm. often we think, when we think about audience, you know, you think about a gallery goer, yeah. a museum goer, um, of a particular demographic, but the reality is by disseminating these images, there are so many people who you may not even know, but who are deeply impacted I by know, this these, work. The, showing them for the first time in Paris was probably the best place to show them. Mm -hmm. I think the audience and the response from the community of people was probably the most powerful audience and response I got from any exhibition I had. Mm -hmm. um, they felt like I was uh, their comrade telling a story that they understood that they were going through the similar things as we yeah. witnessed when we were doing, during the, the protests. Yeah. Um, because initially the works were... Yeah, just a few weeks ago. Just yeah. a few weeks ago. The works were meant to be shown in Hong Kong, mm -hmm. but 
because of what was happening in Hong Kong, it was too political and dangerous for all of us to right. show this work there. Um, and so the gallery just didn't think that we were really willing to risk anyone's life right? because many people were being jailed. And, perceived and, and of dissent, mm -hmm. right, perception of dissent. Um, and so I just thought about another specific space, and I was like, well, then I won't show them. And I thought, and then things, the similar things that were happening in the U.S. was happening in Paris, and it just seemed to make sense to use that as a really great way of um, engagement yeah. for an audience. I think there's... Um, there is community building within that, even though it's not necessarily yeah. direct face-to-face -face con uh, conversation, um, which I think is a through line yeah. in a lot of your artistic practice. Mm -hmm. um, but now, because I'm clock watching. Someone's um, saying someone's doing this. No, I'm looking at Oh mine. yeah, you're so good. Um, <laughs> um, I wanna shift a little bit. In context of community, Artist advocacy is something that is mm -hmm. artist advocacy and um, creating structures of care, education, mm -hmm. and um, professional practices, professional yeah. development is really important to both of us. And you, over the past few years, have um, really formalized a structure and sort of created an institution yeah. around helping artists to survive in an industry yeah. when we're often not provided with the tools um, mm -hmm. to do that. Can you talk a little bit about Art Forward? Yeah, I'll just say this. This is a great quote. I wrote, had to write it down because I often say it wrong. This quote by Toni Morrison that I really liked where she says, black people take their culture wherever they go. Mm -hmm. You can change the plate, but the menu stays the same. And that's about space. Uh -huh. It's about community. It's about a struggle. It's about um, creating our narrative, telling our stories, bringing wherever, however we move through the world, um, the smallest thing to create the quilt mm -hmm. to tell the stories about quilt making. And I think a lot about the idea of quilt making because that is a way of storytelling. Mm -hmm. Um, when things are sort of uh, ripped from you, destroyed, you might only have that one thing that you could sort of pass on. And it has so much meaning that you can sort of generationally sort of carry through. Yes. Um, and I think that's the same with community of like um, creating space. And I think uh, as black people, we have always found sort of no matter the smallest and no matter the situation, no matter the circumstances or obstacles or the burden created sort of that space, whether it's in our barbershops or salons or cooking or whatever, we're gonna create sort of that decipher of community and, and, and love and, and just coming together. And so for me as an artist, I always knew that there will, will, there will become a point in my career where just exhibiting as a solo artist would not be enough. Mm -hmm. And so um, I just actually had this conversation with uh, Bernard Lumpkin the other day, and he and I was remembering a conversation I had at MoMA, and it was about the idea of collaboration. It was a panel I was sitting on, and I think it was probably like around 2013, 14, um, and it was, it was with Zyveria Simmons, Clifford Owens, and uh, Derek Adams. And at this time, the three of those artists, there, if you look at their practice, a lot of it was through collaboration mm -hmm. and community already. And I felt like I was the only <laughs> imposter artist on the stage that just only, I was a painter, you know? <laughs> I worked in my studio. At that point, I didn't yeah. necessarily, I, I never collaborated with anyone, you right. know? I never did other projects with any other artists. And so as we were talking on the panel, I had this conceptual idea about space and community being a collaborative idea. Mm -hmm. And that what if an artist didn't necessarily collaborate with someone with an, you know, an idea that created sort of this like one output that you could recognize. But what if it was about uh, something that you you sort of build up over time, right? You know, 
and you establish uh, is a sense of community. And that particular community was collaborative act. And so I had proposed to them that what I was gonna do, I said, I'm gonna be the type of collaborator that um, when I have a museum show, I want to bring and create space for others mm -hmm. so that they can have that platform of exposure and discourse and dialogue with my work. And so since then, uh, most of the museum shows that I've had, um, when I have the opportunity, and if that museum is open to it, I always include emerging artists. Mm -hmm. Because it's really important, I think, to try to build that community of artists and sort of establish and bring up our artists that you see doing incredible things in the world. Mm -hmm. Because if we don't give each other the opportunities, that those sometimes those opportunities may not come. Right. And so through that working, I decided to um, also think about professional development. Mm -hmm how there was a lack in need in art institutions and art schools of really professionally preparing artists for their careers. Right, because we often forget yes. as artists that we are not just here to sort of make and live in, mm -hmm. who knows where this romantic yeah. idea yeah. of a starving artist came from, but it's not real. It's not real. And you know, we're in a business, we're yeah. in an industry. And so after, curating and creating spaces for others within my own expo exhibitions, whether it was Tete-a-Tete, -tete, the Bass, um, Baltimore Museum, which is here. I, I would create the space, but then on the wall is all local artists from Baltimore. And so some of them, for the first time, never even had an exhibition, one, and let you alone, let, let alone their first exhibition in, in a museum. museum. Yeah. You know, and so for me, that, I want to be, my, I, I definitely want my legacy to be one who sort of carve out space for emerging artists and give them that platform. But not only that, provide professional preparedness right. for their, and awareness of their career. And when I say that professional development, it's about learning how to speak, negotiate, and talk to mm -hmm. curators, gallerists, learning about contracts, um, copyright laws. I should always have a contract. <laughs> All of these things, and whether you ha should have NDAs, because a lot of ways in which I've learned how to manage and maintain my business is somewhat trial and error, you know? Right. Because it's something that is not taught in schools. Art is a business. Being an artist is a small business. Absolutely. You're treated like a small, you're taxed like a small business at least. <laughs> um, and, and so a lot of, I've had a lot of artists um, from emerging to renowned call me for advice. Mm -hmm. And I just remember, it's like, why is this artist asking me about this, you know? Because and then no, our, one, no one is telling us. No one's telling us, and then are getting, I've had one artist, a photographer I will not mention, called me hysterically, asking me if I can help introduce her to a lawyer because she had given all of her negatives to a gallery in Los Angeles, and they were refusing to give her negatives back to her. And I said, well, first of all, let's glitchy, step back. As a photographer, you never give anyone your, your negatives. <laughs> yeah. But it's this naive way of working that artists aren't really educated on or trained, you know? And so just hearing this all the time, this mm -hmm. was coming to me. Um, because, and one of the reasons why they were coming to me, because what I, when I would learn something um, or find out something, I was the one all my friends and artists would go to, because I would like send out an email and say, oh, did you know about this? You know, mm -hmm. did you know you're supposed to do this? Do you know this law? And so my friends, they loved it. So any information I got, I would sort of like dismantle, just like send yeah. it out. And I think that's <laughs> something that I learned from you was now to all of my students or artists who I work with, yeah. I tell them straight up. Yeah. I keep a list. Yeah. Well, as soon as I had a contract, uh, NDA sort of red line template, yeah. template, I would send it out to all my friends. This is what a template looks like. This is what you should have in your studio. So I, I was doing this naturally and just like as a way of just like, because I wanted to make sure we were all protected mm -hmm. and that we all knew because no one was sharing this with us. Mm -hmm. And so I decided to create a not-for-profit around it. And 
I too, I was teaching at Yale. Um, based on my experience with the late Holly Block, when Holly Block was alive and at the Bronx Museum, she had started a program called Artists in the Market. When I was at Yale, she would go around to all of the art schools and do a, a seminar class on artists of the marketplace. That was the only time I've ever got sort of a glimpse into the art as business mm -hmm. was through Holly Block. And I kept all of the paperwork. I kept everything. Because I was like, what do you mean I got to sign up? I got to be a sole proprietor. What do you mean? Like, I was like, what is that? What are you talking about? Like, <laughs> I was like, I don't have an MBA. Like, what do you do? But she provided sort of all of this context mm -hmm. and how artists can protect themselves. And that was the only time that anyone has come into a school to talk about yeah. artists preparing themselves for their future and right. not just making the work, not just being producers, not just being production. Mm -hmm. And so when I started my studio practice and knew that I had to be a sole proprietor and then an LLC and all of these things, all of these other complications started coming in that I just didn't understand. Mm -hmm. And so just really taking some courses and learning about a business side, I just thought it was really important for me to sort of pay that forward. Mm -hmm. So when schools wouldn't invite me as a visiting artist to teach, the course that I would teach, what do you think it was? Artists in the market. So that was what I would do at Yale, and I brought Jasmine in and others and art world leaders to talk about sort of like preparedness and mm -hmm. things that they should do as an artist. And so it became a course that institutions would invite me to teach. And so since I realized there was something that I was really strongly interested and passionate about and as a vision mission for myself and others, that I decided to, I pitched it to Yale first because of some bureaucracy, they couldn't take it. So I just went to my other school that I was connected to, which was Pratt Institute. And so with Francis Bonet, who's the president of Pratt and the uh, chair of painting, Jane South, when I proposed this as an idea, not as a, a program in school, but as a postgraduate program, um, they loved it. And so they partnered with me to create Pratt Forward. And so Pratt Forward is a one month long workshop program for, for professional, our professionals. Intensive, intensive and since program. It's workshop program where we provide an ongoing sort of professional develop, development. Um, and so we're in our third iteration. It's been fantastic. It's a small co cohort, but they're all growing and thriving. It's a learning about your network and where it starts mm -hmm. and how you need to protect yourself as an artist, things you should know about, um, whether you're signing contracts or not, like giving your, your work away. We talk about the idea of donations and what's important about that and what's not important. Um, and how they should do that and how mm -hmm. they should negotiate that, how they should negotiate their 50-50 because it's a fallacy that artists should be given 50-50 to Absolutely. galleries. Um, that worked 20 years ago because mm -hmm. the word patron means to serve. And so there was a moment when patrons provided sort of that support for artists mm -hmm. to create work. So it made sense because the p patrons providing that support for artists and creating salons because they would take care of the artists fully. Right. So it made sense that they got 50% back. Right. right. But the dynamic has The changed. dynamic has completely shifted right. and changed. So artists learning this, and now um, we're creating a curriculum um, for institutions to take it on. And Yale is going to be through their uh, new task force is going to probably be the first school that takes this curriculum that I created which is really fantastic. So that's in a way in which me curating community, but also using um, my friendships and um, own network and community, like individuals like yourself and Derek coming in and sharing in their stories and, and providing sort of uh, awareness based on their own experiences. Yeah, so like to dismantle the idea that everyone loves the art but not the artist mm -hmm. and recentering the mm -hmm. artist at... Yeah at the center of the conversation. Yeah. Yeah. Um, well, I think actually that's perfect timing. So 
You know, we didn't even talk about anything controversial today. But we should. We can we talk can. about Christie's. No, well, just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> Well, <laughs> Sorry. I'll let I'll let people <laughs> ask some questions. Oh, we won't. <laughs> <coughs> Sorry. <clears throat> We'd like to open up for questions since we are have a number of viewers watching online. If you could please wait for the microphone to ask your question. Can you tell us about Christie's? <laughs> I, I, I need to see. I can't see who asked that. Right here. Um, oh, my name is Rebecca Abrams, and I'm interested in hearing your story about the auction houses. Oh, about the auction houses in general? No. Let's just put it this way. Um, let's just start with donations. I don't believe that artists should donate 100% of the work to any institution. Because they only can write off the, material the costs. materials costs. And it's no benefit to them. I think when institutions or organizations ask artists to donate, it should be a way in which they're also giving back to the artist that's donating. And whether that's financial. And, that's what I and think. And let's, let's add a, an element to that. Um, when asking for donations, and a lot of institutions, to their credit, are They're now starting to do understanding it. this, that um, you do a split. Um, if often artists do want to support the organization holistically and That's their choice. Give, yeah, as is their choice. Um, if they'd like to, what we do at my organization is we encourage them to take their split and re-donate it back so that they can get, get the tax, tax right off. Right off, because otherwise, let's say you donate a drawing, what you're getting what twelve dollars back yeah, for the yeah. paper and the paper, pencil, yeah. you know. Um, and so, I think the, the sort of comment and question is about creating equitable structures for artists mm -hmm. to continue to benefit off of what their work is. Um, and so that means if there is a resale of something, that they're just like in any other entertainment industry. Um, there is an opportunity for residuals mm -hmm. um, or some money back to the original, uh, the originator of the thing that is on the market. And that's where Christie's come from. Well, I, I, and, I would say some any, way, any, 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 any auction house any auction or any house secondary house market. To really think about, you know, it's complicated, we know, to really think about the ecosystem includes the artists. The well, structure the, the, the ecosystem the, doesn't include the, the, the well, ecosystem. It starts, it starts with the artist. It artists. starts with the artist, but then artist is excluded from the process. Right. But of I, the addendum I would add to that, um, and I know there are many collectors right. in this room, is that going back to this idea of everyone loves the art but not the, the artist, artist, if you care for the artist and are benefiting financially off of the transaction, it is, is a, a, I think, a sign of caring to so include the artist. In, in the secondary market. In the secondary market transaction. Well, because just think about it. Think about it in a world where you have an artist whose career was at a high, right? For a period of 10, 15, 20 years. And now their work, you know, it's well collected. It's, you know, people have it. And maybe, you know, they're in their late 50s, 60s. Maybe there are careers like this. Right? But now their work is selling at auction. If they got any small percentage of that, that residual back like to 1%. them. One even one percent. One percent of that is equitable funds to them that is almost like a 401k or support system for their career that's sustainable. Right? Because the reason why the art is selling is because of the career, right? <laughs> The reason why it's auctioned and off at a certain price point is because of the artist's career, but the artist is not benefiting from it. And there are many artists, right, whose careers is not that their careers are non-existing, it's just here, right? And maybe some work so, maybe it doesn't, but if maybe all of those works that were at auction, mm -hmm. if they got 1% of that back, that is sort of a financial support 
not only for themselves, but their legacy, their estates, and all of that. So it's really like what Jasmine and I are talking about, creating this sort of system that works for everyone. You know, which is the system that exists in Europe. Yeah, actually. which is the system. Yes. Yeah, in We're California. Just, yeah, and California. in California. But they kind of erased. They pushed it out. California. Oh, hello. And so, from you know, and so try to get to this point with auctions. Don't blame the collectors, <laughs> and collectors don't blame the auctions for not sort of thinking about the artists as sort of an important player and how that structure works. And I think it's it's also not that controversial of an idea because again they do this in film, they do, do this it, in music, they do it, they it, do it in uh, well we're the only literature. visual artists are the only ones that don't receive the residuals. We're the only ones, and actually we're the only ones who do give a large percentage to eight to what are considered agents with our galleries. Most people give anywhere from ten to twenty percent. We give from twenty to sixty percent of our sales which is really uncommon. So, you know, artists, you know, everyone loves the artist. Everyone the artist, loves like the artist. artist. Yeah. You know, you go back to that, and so it's really getting to, it's a new world of collaboration, and sort of it's a global world, and I think artists are working much more independently, and working in ways in which I think auction houses and galleries can start thinking and some galleries have already created structures for their artists, which is really great. When things come to them secondary market, they do give a percentage of that when they sell it. So I would also encourage people, I think there's a great need for auction houses, right? But I also think there's a great way of holding some of them responsible for really including the artists financially. Because they do it with, they, they did do it with NFTs, right? So if NFTs, if we can figure out a way with NFTs where something can go back to the artist, then we can figure out that same system within primary market or secondary market where some of that goes back to the artist. Yeah. Because it could be really sort of beneficial financially to that particular artist at their time or their families or whatever, getting a little increment of that. Back. Mm -hmm. There's a question over there. Uh, yeah, thank you, Alex Skull, Austin, Texas. Um, thank you for all you're doing to you know, educate artists in these areas. Quick question about, you mentioned fair use, and obviously that's been in the news lately. Uh, wanted to hear how you tackled that with the anonymous women. I don't know if the photographer was known from the magazine, and then also yeah. the Supreme Court shifting precedent to, you know, it was always pretty much the one factor used, and now maybe a precedent moving forward of using all four, and how, you know, just your thoughts on that. Because you're talking about the situation with Andy Warhol and his estate and the photographer. Um, and some of the images I use, I do know the photographer from the Jet. He actually is actually uh, very excited that I used these images and included me in his catalog, his monograph that's coming out, and some of his book. And so that's been really great to work with someone, a photographer, directly. But the reason in which the images that I'm using, the archival images, are within fair use because fair use is basically their calendars, right? I'm not using them in the same way that they were intended. So I'm sort of sort of transforming the images and using them in a different way. If I use that image, say like I use the image from the calendar and I say, I printed it in the calendar and I said this is the J July 2000, July 1971 and a cal calendar format, then that no longer fits in within fair use. Because it's in the intent and in how it's used. The problem with the situation with Andy Warhol and his photographer, all they had to do was just pay the photographer. <laughs> the foundation could afford to pay the photographer. The, for, at the end, it would have been $4,000. <laughs> now there's like, so much more thousands of, thousands of dollars, and now it jeopardizes many of us for fair use based on the foundation not wanting to pay the photographer. I've been approached, there are other images that I use, and um, when photographers say, hey, that's my image, even if it is fair use, right? And if they say, oh, you didn't ask me, 
I, I negotiate with the, phot the photographer because they do have a right if they feel that there was something cross. I think they do have a right to say that's my image. It was used in a way that I don't find appropriate. And oftentimes I, I think that as an artist, I, what we usually do is find the artist or a photographer or their estate to see if we could get the license for it. Um, oftentimes you can't and I still use it. And so if they approach me, then I cross that bridge, but I am, I am within fair use. So I feel pretty good about the images. The question over here. Hey, Micheline, welcome back. It's great to see you Hi, again. Good to see you too. And there's so many questions, but in keeping with the current conversation, is there any hope for an Anderson Ranch forward? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I think, I think, I, I mean, I would love to come here and do a sort of professional development. I think it's in, you know, and also my professional development is intergenerational. We've opened it up. It's, you only required uh, to be working about two years, and we're working not, not, not necessarily showing, but just sort of showing that you have a some type of practice going on. And because most of the cohorts, there were actually half of our cohorts were self-taught, that they weren't even in school, and they're doing really well. Um, and so, yeah, I think it's really important for spaces like this to also provide um, professional development um, seminars for their artists. It's um, part, of, a part of holistic development of an is, artist's it career. It's, it's the same, like because we're we're always just focused on the pro producing product, yeah. the product of it, that we forget that we have to go back out into the world and navigate sort of the business of it, <laughs> which we don't. We, I mean, like that's not where we're learning in graduate school. <laughs> no. You know, we're learning concepts, we're experimenting, we're talking about theory. Sorry. We're not talking about like oh, you know. Oh, you making sure that you're, if you hire staff that they sign the NDA because what happened to a lot of artists of certain generation, one being Jasper Johns, some of those people claiming that they actually was the collaborator or wanting sort of you know, some rights to the work because of there's no, in so artists also have to protect themselves. You know, we're exposed in so many different ways and there's so many different things that happen within sort of the business side of managing that we didn't go to business school. And the law is constantly changing, especially if you have employees. So now you're an employer, right? <laughs> so the laws are constantly changing. So you have to be aware of all of those things, but still also create and make art, even if it's just yourself, even if you have one person. Mm -hmm. So I've learned all these things, and for me, it's just really important about education and development and sort of that side of it, and not that it needs to be so focused on that, but just being aware, just being aware of uh, artist rights, um, copyrights, laws, um, accounting, <laughs> bookkeeping, quarterly taxes, like all of these things that really many artists have gotten themselves in trouble with artists are the number one tax payer, payer that's audited in the United States. And I'm sure many of you didn't know that. Hi, um, I'm over here. Uh, so uh, I wanted to talk about something that just passed by the pictures. I wish I would have Which had a moment. Which one was it? Describe it. Um, I, more specifically, I want to talk about the domestic sets that you're creating, mm -hmm. and uh, I was thinking about the ways that home can mean you know, safety and community, and it can be a really safe yeah. space to um, exist, especially when you are um, facing a lot of microaggressions or just like macroaggressions. And so as a Zoomer raised on TV, I start reading them as sitcom sets. Mm -hmm. And I was kind of curious if that was intended. And as I'm thinking about that, I'm thinking about a lot of controversy about representation of like black families on TV reinforcing racial stereotypes. And so you kind of have this opportunity for representation in mm -hmm. that. And also like this, like is all representation, good representation. And I may be reading into that a little bit just in a yeah, domestic setting like that. And I was just kind of curious about like the fabrics and the ways that you're creating these sets to accompany your, um, your paintings and pieces. Most of the ways in which the spaces came about was mostly through photographic images that I found in my family. And so, um, 
I discovered these Polaroids that my mother had and these like five by seven photographs that she took with her disposable camera and images of my childhood and my family growing up was always about this gathering in this, these spaces. But there's also, you know, I was born in the 70s, but I'm more a child of the 80s. And so there's also this space of like memory that's lost or a sort of like time and space that's kind of fabricated. And so I think pictures tell a story, but also they can be an artifice of sort of reality because you don't really know. So it's like, oh, my mother's standing in this room. Is that our apartment? That's our house? No, that's your auntie's house. And that's, but it was always this, these rooms and spaces of gathering and family of my mother, her sisters, and her brothers and cousins, and sort of like entertainment. And so for me, I just remember being this child always on the outside looking in and looking at them as these fabulous spaces and moments of sort of like family and friends and gathering. And then thinking what you said about the sitcom, there is an element of the sitcom, thinking of 9227, 927, 227, uh -huh. the show, and Girlfriends. So girlfriends with Tracy Ellis Tracy Ross, Ellis Ross. Mm -hmm. and um, so sort of those type of uh, performative sort of television shows for me became really interesting gateways in how a very specific communities were defined on TV, mm -hmm. and that was a real. And those were realities to me. Those were sort of like those were the moments where it's just like that's what it is. That's what sort of that sort of beauty and sort of togetherness of moments that you ne you necessarily didn't see, you know what I mean? And or many didn't see or recognize as within black communities. And so for me, really wanting to recontextualize those spaces that were not just something like a period room that people kind of was the outside looking in, but they were immersive. So all of my spaces were immersive spaces where people can actually enter and engage with and interact and sit and have conversation. There would be panel discussions within them. There would sort of be musical or poetry or sort of other activations. And so they expanded beyond just being a corner in the room to sort of a full space like this that was contextualized as a house or a juke joint or sort of uh, a coke den because there were a lot of sort of- Or that. Or that. <laughs> Well, I'll say that because there was, you know, I grew up. It was the 80s. It was the 80s. <laughs> and, you know, you know, there was also this thing um, that's going to come out in, like, this little documentary that I'm, I'm doing is there was a part of my life that was sort of uh, a lie where for many years my mother was married to someone who sold drugs. And so we w grew up in New Jersey in this area where she was, driving a Cadillac, we had this big house, we were living in a certain way, and then I discovered later, and if some of you see my documentary, Happy Birthday to a Beautiful Woman, some of those elements came out, that story of my mother when she was an addict and sort of how she was married to this drug. So more of that narrative of my life is now being exposed because a part of those images that I saw and know is actually a lie, you know? And so I'm using those images as ways of telling story. You know, there's one with the mirrored room. That mirrored room. From the bath. In the bath mm -hmm. was created from a Polaroid I found of my mother standing in this mirrored room was the basement. It was this room I can never go to. I never knew why. But now, as an adult, I know why I couldn't go there. Yeah. <laughs> you know, so it's like all of these things that become a part of your history and your life that you tell. It's like, oh, wow, okay, that's why I couldn't go to that room? Oh, okay. Um, and so, but in my mind, that room was some of this fantastical things like, ooh, you know, it's the mirrors. Like, we would sneak in there and we were like, oh, these leather couches and coolness. But it was a room where my mother's boyfriend had his drug dealers go and they kind of did their thing, and, but I didn't know that. That room was different for me. So creating the space at, at Bass was really sort of reclaiming what those ideas were for me as a person and how I thought of them. We have one final question. Uh, hi there. My question pertains to a, uh, oh, stand up, okay. <laughs> Hello. Um, my question pertains to an image that I saw that also relates to the interiors, the mismatched patterns, and it had uh, four 
images on the wall and they themselves were very mismatched and put together. And I wanted to uh, ask if you could talk about the relationship between those uh, faces, those images, and those patterns as well, because I know in art history, usually when the body is severed or in pieces, it's to invite a conversation about a type of mourning. Yeah, there's always mourning in my work. I think there's always this sort of this dealing with the reality of chaos and control and pain, desire. Desire and love. Love is also painful, but it's also beautiful, right? Heartache, breakup, all of that. Sort of like all of sort of the, sev the you know, level of emotions that we can probably go in just in one day. <laughs> You know, and uh, how do you express that? How do you see that? And sort of juxtaposition of a, the different patterns is just really a, a form of collage, you know, collaging of the space uh, elements and sort of bringing different ideas and materials and texture to the space that allows for me to just really make sense of it, you know, in a way that, you know, where you think you're, you think you think there's the truth of something, and then you find out it's something different. And how do you put those together? And how do you really tell that story? Perspectival shift, yeah. Mm -hmm. You know, which is, for me, always kind of like, you know, a way of contemplating and sort of really getting into the work because I don't always know the answer, and I'm not. I'm okay with not always knowing the answer in, in, in some ways in which I know I just need to make them, you know? But it always comes back to um, the stories and sort of relationships to my mother or an idea or an image that I find within my own family. My mother had this very fascination with disposable cameras and it was interesting because my first, that first, that photograph I described with the green background and me in the black and yellow striped bathing suit, that was shot with a disposable camera. And it was when I took David Hillier's class, I couldn't afford cameras. And he's, so I used disposable cameras my first like month until I was able to buy a 35 millimeter. So all of my earlier photographs were done with disposable cameras. There's like, I think some things that are sort of mystical in the world that happens in your life and sort of you adapt even without knowing. It's the language of your environment that you sort of take on without knowing. My grandmother used to upholster all of her furniture, right? I think me reupholstering and bringing in these patterns is sort of, you know, this innate way of sort of the language that I grew up around, right? Sort of art is an extension of yourself, right? You as artist is the vehicle of the extension of what you express. And so, and sometimes you don't know that until you start looking back and seeing, oh, that's why I do that, right? I do that because I grew up around that. <laughs> I do that because I understand what that means. And, and that's the language. And so you use that language as a tool to create and make your work. That's a great. That's a great that's a great place to end it. I want to thank you both for an amazing conversation. <clears throat> thank you all for coming. I have two quick things I want to mention. Uh, on the 31st of July, we'll be having uh, an Anderson Ranch Critical Dialogue with artists uh, Alan Michelson and Mary Mattingly, um, moderated by Brooklyn-based Climate Museum Director Miranda Massey about the connection between art and climate change. Space is limited. If you're interested, we can get a, a, a flyer from us and sign up. And next week on Thursday, Paul Pfeiffer will be here, the fourth in the summer series. Thank you so much. <laughs>